everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you, uh, Nigel Chris, with us in this meeting of the Health uh, Region Summit. And uh, I'm going to refer some notes about your career. Lord Nigel Crisp is an independent crossbench member of the House of Lords, where he co-chairs the all-party parliamentary group on global health. He also co-chairs Nursing Now, the global campaign on nursing. He was previously chief executive of the English National Health System and permanent secretary of the United Kingdom Department of Health, the largest health, health organization in the world with 1.3 million employees, where he led major reforms between 2000 and 2006. Lord Crisp is a senior fellow at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and honorary pro professor of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a foreign associate of the US National Academy of Medicine. He was formerly a distinguished visiting fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health and Regions, lecturer at uh, Berkeley University. Thank you again, Lord Nigel, Nigel Crisp. Thank you for your contribution to this uh, Health uh, Region Summit and I uh, pass the world to you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and um, uh, what a pleasure to join you. Um, only sorry, I'm not with you in person. I won't move my camera around so you can see what a grey day it is here in uh, in England. I imagine it's rather better uh, weather in uh, where, where you all are. Um, but um, pleasure to join you anyway. I'm going to try and um, uh, and uh, share my slides and just check that I can do that. So I'm going to just try and do that now, share my screen. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking actually about health in the round, not just about health care. And, and I think, you know, as I understand the nature of your summit and talking about people in regional government, of course, you're not just interested in the health care bit of it, you're interested in the, the health uh, and other features, of course, of your entire regions. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. And of course, we can't really separate healthcare from other features, other public services, the economy, education, and everything else. It's intimately part of it all. And I think if we didn't know that before, COVID really has reminded us of how all these things are so intimately connected. And of course, that appalling war in, or appalling invasion in, in, in Ukraine is also something which is having profound health impacts um, as well as everything else that is uh, that is happening there. So I'm going to be talking in that wider way about sustainable health and planetary resilience. And I start off with a title at the top of this, which is Health is Made at Home, Hospitals are for Repairs, uh, which was a great statement which was made by a, a, a good friend of myself and indeed a good friend of Portugal, um, Professor Francis Omazwa, um, who was running the Ugandan health services at the beginning of the century, around about the same time as I was running the ones in, uh, in England. And he was making the point that health is made at home. It's everything contributes to our, our health, everything around us, our family, our education, what happens to us at work and so on. Uh, and hospitals, the health system, if you like, uh, gets us back on track. It, it, uh, it does the repairs, if you like, in that, uh, in, in that context. Uh, but it's also interesting in itself because it also makes the it gives the idea that health can be made, health can be created. And that's the sense in which I'm going to be using this today. Because having worked in Africa for a few years and worked, spent some important time in Portugal as well with the Gulbenkian, um, which, I, which I greatly enjoyed, um, I now think of health as being in three parts. Firstly, there's the creating conditions for people to be healthy, the health creation bit. Secondly, very important point for governments about preventing disease and promoting health. And thirdly, of course, the extraordinarily valuable uh, part that the health professionals and carers play in providing health and care services. So I think we need to think about health in these three parts. And particularly when we're thinking about sustainable health and in the longer term, I think these all fit together extremely well. I'm gonna concentrate in what I'm talking about in the first part of this. I won't say very much about the second at all, but I will return to the last one about providing health and care services uh, at the end of these few minutes. So I start off in, in thinking about this by uh, you know, what I learned in Africa, really, and actually what I learned in Portugal as well. And I think what one learns when one's working in any country other than one's own and any health system other than one's own, and it's this, we need to take off our SNS spectacles, 
take off our NHS spectacles in my case. Get rid of some of our preconceptions. Um, think about the world differently and think about health differently and recognize, for example, the extraordinarily important part that schools, workplaces, communities, families, uh, everybody play in health. Um, and that they are not just a marginal uh, role, they're actually in many ways central and, uh, and in many ways the starting point for health. And we now see that there's much more scientific evidence than there ever has been before about the impact of nature, the relationship between nature and our health, how being in nature, being in a green environment um, produces physiological changes. It calms us down. It, it helps us to, to think better in many ways. There's also greater evidence about relationships, about having, having a, a social relationship, um, having a social circle, having some meaning in life, how much this also impacts on our health. And good evidence, not only that people who are in a strong social support system are more resilient, their immune systems may be stronger, but that also um, they recover more quickly from illness. And then I don't need to say anything about exercise or diet. So, so I was talking nice. about the importance of taking off our SNS spectacles and seeing the world in a different way and recognizing the wider role that people have in, in creating health. Let me then talk about what do we mean by health? I mean, a really important point, and I, I'm sure we're all familiar with the WHO definition of health, which is about health is about physical, mental and social well-being. And it's interesting, isn't it, that actually we have focused very much on health and, as a physical uh, well-being point, but we haven't talked very much. Well, in the, la in the last hundred years, we've started to put mental health on the, uh, on the agenda. And in the UK, we now have mental health on, uh, in equal esteem with physical health, but we haven't talked much about social health and we haven't really implemented um, much work around social health. So that's what the sort of official definition of health is. It's about physical, mental and social well-being. Um, but in a sort of more human terms, it's, it's, it, health is about life and freedom, confidence, the quality of our lives. It's about our relationships, fundamentally about our relationships, about how we feel, about what happens to us at school and at work. And it's being all we can be and living our lives to the full. So when I talk about creating health in, these, in, in this position, I talk about providing the conditions for people to be healthy and helping them to be so. And it's what a, a good parent does. It's what our parents did for us, I hope. It's what a good teacher does. It's what a good community does. It's, it's helping create confident, competent, capable and healthy individuals. And a really important point that all those adjectives are linked. And we, in our health systems, tend to think about health as, as being separate in some ways, whereas actually health isn't an add-on to life. It's linked with all of those other things and that actually we, we, we need to be integrating it much more into our other activity. And all of that, it seems to me, reminds us that our health as individuals is fundamentally linked to the health of communities. It's fundamentally linked to the health of wider society and it's fundamentally linked to the health of the planet. And I'm beginning to start to use that framework, the individual, communities, society and the planet as being a framework within which um, to think about what it is, what are, what are the roles of government, what are the roles of, of, of health institutions at all of those levels. And we need to make sure that we deal with health at all of those levels. So if I just take those in turn, if I think of it at the individual level, well, obviously at the individual level, people are in charge of their own lives. They make their own choices. They take their action. Um, but there's more that we can be doing in terms of not just providing health services, um, but we've got something happening in the United Kingdom, which I don't think is happening in Portugal, but I may be, I may be uh, corrected on that, which is called social prescribing. Uh, this is an attempt to get away from pharmaceutical prescribing. In fact, there's a campaign of no more drugs um, that is being launched in, uh, in a few weeks time here in the UK uh, by our general practitioners. And social prescribing is the prescribing of dance, singing, gardening, um, exercise, um, all of these sort of things. And there's a wonderful, for example, um, primary care facility in the south of the country that I've been to, but it's not the only one. 
um, where there's a singing group associated with it, where there's a dance group associated with it. And these things are so fantastically important because they combine not just the sort of exercise and actually singing uh, can be good for people with respiratory problems, um, uh, whatever the result of their singing may be, um, and dance and exercise is important, but actually they also combine social activity. So you're actually getting the best benefit of doing things socially and doing exercise and so on. Um, so we've now got a very advanced um, system of this in every primary care practice in the UK. Um, people are now doing social prescribing, trying to get the individual um, to be doing things in a different way. And we're beginning to see some positive results. It's early days. It's only two or three years that we've been uh, doing this at any scale, um, but we're starting to see the results. If I move up to the community level, um, we see lots of local groups doing things, gardening groups, for example, people coming together in the sort of way that in the sense that I've just been talking about, reaching out to others. Um, this is also the area where it seems to me the scope for a lot of education. But there's also a very important point here for, for government more generally, which is that we in the UK, over the years of austerity um, from 2010 onwards, we got rid of a lot of our community infrastructure. Um, and actually the community infrastructure, whether it's libraries or playing fields or spaces or, or, or things happening in the local area, um, is really important because it gives you the scope to bring people together to help create health together. Um, and we've made some very big mistakes in doing that. And it does seem to me that one of the things that we have been pressing very hard with our current government to try and do is to recognize that actually healthy individuals are in healthy communities. Um, and let me just tell you just, just, just one simple story about how a nurse uh, approached this in, a, in an area of Manchester. She was trying to improve health across a, a relatively poor community, which was four council housing estates, you know, uh, sort of thing. And she realized that there were an awful lot of unemployed men there. Um, and actually what she then realized was that we mostly saw them as a problem, but actually she saw them as a great asset because these were youngish, fittish <laughs> men who were in the community all day. And she managed to get them to work together to sort of start to create community facilities and build the community. And she managed to get some money from the local authority to help and support them do that. And they set up play groups. They did things with their children. They reconnected more with their children. Um, and of course, one of the results of all of this is that over time, those many of those men actually got jobs. <laughs> they got their confidence back and they got jobs. Now, this was about creating the sort of healthy community in which people can thrive. Uh, they called it, incidentally, Salford Dads. Um, so the Fathers of Salford um, is, is how these men, uh, they, they called their organization. And it was interesting for the nurse because she actually started at the front of the room, if you like. She started by organizing it, but later on she was at the back of the room applauding what they were doing. So this was building community and building strength. And, and I think government sometimes misunderstands the importance or doesn't understand the importance of some of the co community facilities that are around the place that can be used to support and create health. If I then move on to the third area, which is wider society, this is the area where we need to think about inequalities. And COVID in our country showed us the enormous inequalities. It was, you know, poorer people, people in less secure jobs, people from ethnic minorities and older people and fatter people. <laughs> um, who got COVID and suffered much more from it. But it was very clear how, how uh, COVID revealed the inequalities in our country. Um, and this, of course, is the area of society where the wider determinants of health are so important. And for us in the UK, what we're really trying to, to push on uh, here is the uh, issues of health around opportunity, around education, around employment and something I'm taking through the United Kingdom uh, Parliament and indeed had a debate on it yesterday is the vital role that housing has and housing of a decent standard. During COVID, we were stuck in our houses um, and those of us with nice houses and nice gardens were well placed, but we have some appalling housing in the UK and we've long known the, the, the impact of poor housing, whether it's about isolation, whether it's about cold, whether it's about damp, whether it's about being cramped, whether it's about, we saw an increase in domestic abuse 
when people were locked up in their houses. Um, we saw children from poorer households in smaller houses unable, of course, to do their homework and so on. Um, so there's a big set of issues around the inclusiveness of society, opportunity, education, employment and housing. And then if I move on to the, the, the top level, the, the, the planetary uh, resilience one, well, there is obviously an awful lot of things that, that need to be picked up here around food and farming, around biodiversity and, and carbon capture. Um, and we in the NHS, we in the health systems, it's worth just noting that um, health systems globally contribute um, about 4.4% of all carbon emissions. And that's from our institutions, it's from travel, it's um, uh, and, there's so, uh, and there's so much more we could do to reduce that. Um, and you may be aware of a movement globally that is starting, which is about green universal coverage. Not only trying to get universal coverage for everyone, but doing it in a green way. And part of that is a very big thing that is starting to happen in a number of our local authorities and may be happening in yours as well, our metropolitan uh, districts and so on, um, is circular economies. Um, uh, so, for example, our hospitals very often bought their food from a long way away. Why didn't they use local suppliers? Um, why didn't they use small businesses locally? Why didn't they? Uh, what did they do about the waste and so on? And this whole idea of circular economies where people are making use of local facilities, local engagement, um, as some of our communities say, keeping the money in our area, um, uh, developing, shortening supply chains, um, supporting local businesses. So we have, a, we have, a, we have a, a role in the UK where our bigger hospitals are seen as what are called anchor institutions in their communities. And they are very much taking the role of um, looking after the small people, you know, the people where you buy your sandwiches from, but the, the people who supply the food, uh, the people who provide the transport and so on, and bringing contracts local, locally. Um, as well as engaging as anchor institutions in the local schools, um, looking, of course, for the next generation of health workers um, uh, and working with people uh, around their own health in all kinds of ways. So what we're seeing, it seems to me, is health and well-being becoming much more, even more central in life. I mean, in COVID, it was absolutely central, but actually, and of course, COVID isn't over, let's be clear, um, but in, in COVID, it became absolutely central. But I think as we develop our plans and policies for every area, whether it's the environment and the planet or the economy and so on, we need to be seeing health as more central. And we also need, as health workers, to recognise we've got that wider role. And that takes me to the, my, my two final points, which are about how do we make this happen? Because actually what I'm talking about here is when you really think about it, a, quite a profound change. It's bringing in that aspect of that, you know, health and society closer together. And we need some facilitators and enablers for that. And I'm gonna pick up two. One is health workers and the other, of course, is technology. Um, uh, and in health workers, if we think about the sort of scenario that I'm talking about here, increasingly health workers are gonna be, have to be like that nurse in, in Manchester. Um, not doing things, but influencing, engaging, informing, enabling, listening, responding, working with people, um, you know, so that you're not only a brilliant clinician, um, you're also somebody who is enabling and influencing others to create health. You're influencing the school. Um, you're starting at the front of the room, if you like, and ending up at the back. And I think this is going to be a much bigger role for the future. There was a very good um, assessment uh, of the future education of health workers, um, profession, of health professionals published in uh, 2010, uh, which was 100 years after Flexner, the Flexner report, which uh, established the scientific basis for, for, for medical schools. Um, and it actually looked at health education, uh, professional education as having three levels. What it called the informative level, this was when you learnt about the body systems. This is when you became a specialist. There was the formative level after that, which was the level at which 
uh, you as professionals became professionals. You added that specialist knowledge to the behavior, the ethics, the how you did things as professionals, um, the attitudes and so on. And then the, the top level of, of professional education, this, 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 uh, this, this report proposed, um, was what they called transformative education. Um, and this was about the point at which you became a leader, at which you became an agent of change. You weren't just dealing with the patient in front of you. You were impacting on the system. You were changing what was happening around you. And I think this role is going to become even bigger. And if I think with my global perspective on it, of the millions of people, the, the billion people around the country, around the world, sorry, who don't have access to a health worker, they're not going to have the same sort of health systems as we have in Europe. Um, uh, and health workers, if they're going to reach them, are going to have to do things in a different way. So this notion of health workers as great clinicians, but also as agents of change, um, is what I think drives some of the changes we're seeing. And if I think of the single-handed psychiatrist in the in, in the in the uh, in a large community in the state of Bihar in India, for example, no other psychiatrist for miles around. Um, how they work, how they need to work, how he needs to work, she needs to work, um, is by engaging the temple, by engaging the other groups around, helping, getting them involved in mental health care and mental health prevention, mental disease prevention. But it's also how some of our primary care doctors are starting to work. And there's a great GP in, again, somewhere in the south of England, um, who has brought local community groups together so she works as a clinician, but she also works outside her surgery in bringing local groups together around the idea of growing health in Hawley, growing health together, creating health. And these, these may be people as diverse as local schools, but, but also you know, gardening groups, singing groups, people working with disabled people, people who between them are all doing this thing of creating the conditions for people to be healthy and helping them to be so. So I think fundamentally the health workers role over the next 15, 20 years is likely to change, or many of them are likely to change, to take on this bigger role of an agent of change. Um, and then technology. Well, of course, technology is, is, is remarkable um, in every way. And if I think of the three things I talked about at the, right at the beginning about the three aspects of health, of creating health, preventing disease and providing health services, well, there are enormous roles, of course, um, the technology in all of those. In the creating conditions for health, the bit I've spent most time talking about, we saw in the UK, and I suspect you did in, in, um, uh, in, in, in Portugal, the extraordinary way technology helped with that. Um, it, most of our villages set up their own little community groups, technology groups, and shared ideas, and set up little local working together, you know, providing food for elderly people or providing uh, things that people, you know, when people were sheltering, providing, bringing food to their door or, or whatever, all those kind of things. In the preventing disease and promoting health level, well, I, I know that your conference is, is, is supported by Sanofi uh, and uh, the, you know, the whole range of vaccines and vaccinations and what they're able to do, uh, plus all the things about measuring air pollution, making sure we understand the problems we have. And then, of course, the extraordinary role that technology is going to be providing in providing health and care services right the way through. The one thing I would say about this is all the recent studies show that technology will be very important, but that it won't in the end replace people. People will end up doing different jobs. Um, so, you know, we will see the technology supporting and enabling things, and we will see people moving on into doing other jobs, some of which will be in that territory I'm talking about uh, uh, of agents of change. So really, just to just to sum up um, where, what, what, I, what I've been trying to say, I think that as we look towards the future and we think about sustainable healthcare and planetary resilience, then we have to see health much more integrated into other things. We have to see health as part of what education does and education perhaps as part of what health does. We need to see it across our institutions. Um, uh, and of course, um, the, uh, uh, the, the counterbalance of uh, 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 of all of that is that um, it means that our health workers have to get better at influencing those institutions. And that's the point about agents of change uh, and how that will work. So we will see a big change happening. We will see the continuation of the fantastic stuff that the clinicians in your room uh, 
do on a day-by-day -day basis with individual patients and we need that uh, we need the, the repairs if you like from what i was uh, talking about earlier um, but we also need um, the uh, this new development of new ways of thinking about health new and old ways of thinking about health actually but the development of our health professionals as people who really make change happen not on an individual patient or individual patient group but across a, a, a wider area and the final point I was just going to make was that um, this is a global activity and we can learn about this. And I have learned a great deal about what I'm talking about now from low and middle income countries. Um, they can learn from us, the richer countries of the world as well, all of us and from what we do. Um, but we do need to be really thinking and sharing together. And indeed, um, as Paula knows, I have another book out, <laughs> which is talking about turning the world upside down again and how we should think about global health in a time of pan pandemics, climate change, and political turmoil. But let me stop there. I'm sorry not to manage to do the slides properly, um, but yeah. I hope the, the message is got across. Absolutely. A round of applause, I would say, for a, a, a Lord Nigel, please, from uh, such generous sharing. And uh, I think uh, we have a few minutes for questions, right, Nigel? Oh, please, yeah, no, I'm... I'm uh, anyone would like to have a quick question in order to have Jean Cusado? Can you please, uh, Dr. Jean Cusado is our um, uh, guest speaker for the Health Innovation Bootcamp in the afternoon. He's uh, already uh -huh. with us in Madeira. Can you take the mask, please? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your. Uh, I'd like to make you a question on what is going on in terms of uh, Europe and uh, in some countries like Portugal. What do you think that should be in the future a more strategic partnership between uh, the the governments and the, the different stakeholders like the companies and the, the universe. Do you think that we still have a lot to do in order to accomplish what we were talking about in terms of this new health system? Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry I can't get to an innovation boot camp in the afternoon. That sounds <laughs> that sounds very good. Um, so you're, you're saying about the partnership between government and the different stakeholders. Yeah, I, I think that's I, I, it's vital. It's absolutely essential. We've just got a health and care bill in, in the House of Lords at the moment, which is about that. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, we actually had a, we actually had a, a bill yesterday on housing um, where I was trying to insert health into the bill on housing um, uh, and make sure that, you know, that was part of the uh, part of the discussion and part of the debate. Um, so government can do so much in setting the direction. Um, I think that's really important. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm convinced that I'm not a clinician. I'm convinced that actually what happens in health is what happens in your heads, you as clinicians. You know, how you see the world is what really counts. If you see the world in a certain way, that's actually what happens within health. And that's how you influence each other. Uh, and that's how you influence other people. Because health professionals not only are great experts in their own area, you're really authoritative people in society. I don't need to tell you that. <laughs> um, but, you know, people listen to you. Um, and I think the biggest single change that will, will come will be about how health professionals see the world, how health professionals see their role and how health professionals see health. Um, but it will be absolutely fundamental that um, government recognises that health actually is is fundamental in so many areas not least of which in ensuring that you've got a healthy and productive population and thereby helping drive prosperity too thank you so much nigel i think we have to adjourn the session now and otherwise we're going to miss our time for lunch uh, hopefully thank you can you so join much. us uh, next year as we're going to have and announce some interesting collaborations between the macaronesia region so it's uh, uh, four different uh, uh, islands that will be part of three countries and then they will be together in, a, in an alliance for improving healthcare and I'm sure your contributions, your advice, your guidance will be very much appreciated and we'll be back to you on this after this summit. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to join you. I'm sorry I can't join you for lunch. Uh, I'm good Portuguese uh, lunches. <laughs> you would be loving the menu, I'm sure. <laughs> very Thank good. You. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Nigel, e muito obrigado a todos os participantes uh, que nos acompanham aqui, os co da sessão anterior, a doutora Rosa de Matos, a doutor Luís Pisco, a professora Tavera Gomes. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here with us. 
uh, in the virtually and uh, so sorry that you can also not uh, joining lunch with us. Thank you so much and the session is now adjourned. We'll be back here at 2.30. As duas e meia de volta aqui à Sala Madeira. Bons tempos, bom almoço.